friends, I'm Jeffrey Rosen, President and CEO of the National Constitution Center, and welcome to We the People, a weekly show of constitutional debate. The National Constitution Center is a nonpartisan nonprofit chartered by Congress to increase awareness and understanding of the Constitution among the American people. On President's Day, I was thrilled to launch my new book, The Pursuit of Happiness at the NCC, under the First Amendment tablet with Jeffrey Goldberg, the editor-in-chief of The Atlantic. Dear We the People listeners, I know I've been sharing a lot of the Pursuit of Happiness launch events with you and hope you'll find this conversation fresh and illuminating. I love talking with Jeff, and as you'll see, his chat GPT sonnet has put me out of the sonnet writing business. Thank you for listening, and thank you for reading the book if you're moved to get it. I hope you find it meaningful, and I so appreciate the notes from We the People listeners asking for signed book plates and letting me know what you think of the podcast. If you'd like a signed book plate, email me at jrosen at constitutioncenter.org, and I'd be honored to send one to you. Enjoy the conversation, and happy listening. Hello, friends. What a thrill to welcome you to the National Constitution Center on President's Day. It has been a wonderful President's Day full of students and learners and presidential impersonators. And that's uh, thanks to our friends at Citizens Travelers, who not only sponsored President's Day, but have a wonderful civics initiative to inspire their employees to learn about the Constitution, and we're so grateful for their sponsorship. Friends, I also want to acknowledge some very special guests in the front row. They're all sitting together. They are uh, Pamela Reeves, Lauren Coyle-Rosen, and Judge Michael Ludig. And I must thank Judge Ludig for having had the vision to bring the First Amendment tablet that is shimmering behind us from Washington, D.C. to Independence Mall in Philadelphia. It sanctifies this sacred space. And let's just all feel the vibe of Independence Hall and the First Amendment and how lucky we are to be here. And thank you, Judge Ludig, for making that possible. I'm so excited that my friend, my editor, the great Jeffrey Goldberg, has come to Philly to talk about the book. You know him, one of the great journalists of our generation. He's read it, and I can't wait to hear what he thinks. And to have our conversation, please join me in welcoming Jeffrey Goldberg. Thank you, Jeff. I really do feel like we're operating under the protection of the First Amendment tonight. You know, a, and Judge Ludig, you drove this down in your pickup truck, right? One, <laughs> one, one slab at a time. It's really quite, it's really quite amazing. Um, thank you, Jeff. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, you all, uh, this is the subject um, uh, of, of our talk tonight. Um, I guarantee you that in 58 minutes, you will be happier than you were when you came in here. <laughs> or at least you'll have self-knowledge that you didn't have before. You'll just have a, a path for improvement, because this book is actually, um, it's, it's not about the pursuit of happiness as we, as a society, have come to understand the pursuit of happiness. And you talk about this in the book, uh, obviously, that, that at some point um, in the 60s, perhaps, 60s and 70s, the me decade especially, um, the pursuit of happiness became the pursuit of whatever makes you happy, or the do your own thing, or you know, you do you, kind of um, uh, idea, but what you were meant, what you set out to do and what I think you did successfully was explain what the founders meant when they used the term pursuit of happiness. And I, and uh, it's really an extraordinary book and it is, it's a rare, it's a, and I'll stop being nice to him in a minute. I'm sorry. (laughs) Um, But um, it's, it's the rare book that you can call simultaneously uh, a, a work of original history and a self-help book. And I don't say that in kind of, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a slight offhand way about some of the trifling self-help books that we see. You actually, uh, in reading this, you will see how great people led their lives uh, and y- you will be stimulated to think about the way you lead your own life. Um, 
Which brings me to, this, to the foundation story, which I'd like you to tell. Why you wound up writing this book. It wasn't necessarily on your dance card um, before the pandemic, but there you are in the pandemic and you were having thoughts. Tell us how this came to be. Uh, I'm delighted to share that this project, it originated during COVID with Benjamin Franklin and the Jews. So that was the connection. Uh, a friend and I had been studying at Addis Israel, our local synagogue in DC, and the rabbi there recommended this project called Musar, or character improvement, where every night you're supposed to make a list of the 13 virtues that were on the list and put an X mark where you fell short. And there are virtues like temperance, prudence, humility, and so forth, which is the hardest one to follow. And you, and, and, and a friend and I tried this, this is Frank Four, and it was very depressing because there were so many X marks and we gave it up um, after a while. During COVID- How I, many X marks exactly? <laughs> on average. If there were 13, no, there were seven days of the week, there were like, at that point there were seven next to temperance. Or, it was a tough time actually. And it, it's a difficult system to try when you're in an emotionally turbulent time. What I learned during COVID was that this didn't originate with a Hasidic rabbi, but with Benjamin Franklin. And in his, in his autobiography, he was the one who came up with this 13 Virtues project in his effort to achieve moral perfection in his 20s. And he had made the list of the virtues. He tried the X marks. He too found it depressing after a while, but was glad that he tried it. The COVID revelation was that Franklin chose as a motto for his project, a book by Cicero I'd never heard of called the Tusculan Disputations, and it said, without virtue, happiness cannot be. So I thought, I haven't heard of this Cicero book. Interesting. A few weeks later, I was at, at UVA, as it happens, at the Boar's Head Inn and saw on the wall a list of 12 virtues that Thomas Jefferson had drafted for his daughters. And they were almost identical to Franklin's. And Jefferson, too, had this passage from Cicero, uh, the Tusculan Disputations, that he would send to anyone who asked when he was old what the meaning of happiness was. And it said, without virtue, happiness cannot be. He who is tranquil in mind, who's neither uh, unduly despondent or in date, in date, indulges in wanton exaltation, he is the happy man of whom we are in quest. He's the wise man. So I thought, OK, I've got to read this Cicero, because I've never read it. What else to read? And then I came across. A, a reading list that Jefferson would send to anyone who asked how to be an educated person. And it's an arduous schedule. You're supposed to get up at dawn and start reading history and politics and then have lunch and uh, read the moral philosophy and then dinner you're allowed some Shakespeare and then to bed. It's a kind of staccanovite reading schedule. And under the section called Natural Religion or Ethics, I found at the top Cicero's Tusculan Disputations, and then 10 works of moral philosophy that I'd never read. And they included Stoic and other Greek and Roman philosophers like Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius and Seneca, but also Enlightenment philosophers like Locke and Francis Hutcheson and Lord Kames, most of whom I'd not read. So what so struck me during COVID is I, 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 that I'd never encountered any of these books. I've had this wonderful liberal arts education, great teachers at great universities studying political philosophy, law, English, history, but never the moral philosophy. And I remember you talk about the greed is good decade. I was yearning for this in college. I wanted some guidance about how to live a good life that was an alternative to the materialism and hedonism of pop culture, which I, of course, was indulging in, but felt unsatisfied, <laughs> unsatisfied by. And religious dogma and doctrine was not adequate for me. I was studying Puritan theology and was working through the hair splitting of the doctrine of predestination and, and did not find that a, a, a meaningful guide for how to live a good life, so what to read. And what I didn't realize, because it was just hiding in plain sight, is that it was all of this great moral philosophy. So I read it during COVID. I talk about the unusual practice that I developed, which was to get up early like Jefferson, watch the sunrise, read from the wisdom literature. I found myself summing up the wisdom in sonnet form and, uh, and, and then uh, would uh, proceed through this marvelous- How many sonnets list. did you write to help you? I mean, it, I was kind of writing one a day, and I You're read, writing a sonnet a day. Read, read through these things. Look, I know this is extraordinarily weird, <laughs> and I never. It's only expected... 14 lines. I mean, it's a. Well, there's there's a there's a history. My beautiful and wonderful and brilliant 
wife, Lauren, is a poet. And before this project started, I saw Lauren kind of channeling poetry in real time, just having it come out. It was so extraordinary. I said, I could never do that. And she said, yes, you, you can. Why don't you try it? And I'd started writing poetry, you know, a few months, a little bit before this project started and, and got the habit of it. It was just a practice. And during COVID, a friend of mine, Barry Edelstein, has a, had a YouTube video about how to write a Shakespearean sonnet. Um, and uh, that inspired me to try to sum this up in, in, in Shakespearean sonnet form. But what's so amazing is not the sonnets, but the oh. fact that so many people who have been read this literature are moved to do the same thing. And Phyllis Wheatley, the great black poet, Alexander Hamilton, uh, Mercy Otis Warren, the brilliant anti-federalist, and John Quincy Adams would wake up at the White House, read Cicero in the original, write sonnets, which are excellent, and then take a walk along the Potomac and watch the sunrise. So it's just, there's something in the air about this beautiful, harmonious literature that kind of craves to be summed up in, in, in distilled form. So I have a whole lot of sonnets, and, and I finished the uh, year of reading uh, the moral wisdom, and it just transformed my life, the way I think about how to be a good person and how to be a good citizen. This is a, a small question that obviously opens up to a larger subject we'll talk about, but you're describing your morning routine. How do you keep away from your phone? That is the crucial question for the pursuit of happiness. It's the sim and every morning still, it's, a, it's a, qu a question, will I browse or will I read? And I kept away with it just by developing a habit. I developed a rule, I'm not allowed to browse. In the morning, I have to read. And every morning, I have to read and not browse. And it's a temptation. And sometimes I fall and fail and you know, browse the Atlantic or whatever. But generally, I don't. <coughs> generally that's, I don't. that's allowed by our standards, <laughs> But th this is actually my big takeaway. And I've become an evangelist for the radical act of self-assertion involved in deep reading. And it requires habits. This is what Jefferson and Franklin and Adams had. And it's so inspiring. They're, they're old, they fell short of so many of their virtues, which, all of which we'll talk about, but they're reading and learning until the end. And once you have a habit or a practice of reading, then you have to do it. And I, I still can't believe the, the sonnets, and then I can't believe I wrote this book in a year, but it was all because I just set dedicated time aside in the morning to read. Right. Um, talk a little bit about the organization of the book, um, different virtues, different founders. Um, and so just, to, just to give you a framework of, of how you organize this. But, and, then, and then take us to, I mean, sort of dealer's choice. They're all interesting. I want to know which combination of virtue, founder, stoic source actually moved you the most as a person and then also as an academic? Well, the, there were 12 virtues that I used. Jefferson had 12, Franklin had 13. I, I left off chastity. You left off chastity because Franklin had a hard time with chastity. He really right? did, he struggled and he, had his uh, illegitimate son who turned against him and became a, a Tory, and, um, and then his grandson went on to torture a uh, Federalist as the leading um, Republican journalist. But um, I uh, just chose 12, and then I more or less mixed and matched. I wanted to cover the main founders as well as it was urgently important to cover Phyllis Wheatley and Mercy Otis Warren, as well as lesser known founders like James Wilson and George Mason. So for example, for Mason and Wilson, they were both undone by their, by their avarice and their lack of industry. So they went in the um, frugality section because they didn't exercise that. And uh, industry was Jefferson for his reading list. But you ask, who did I most resonate with? And it was John Quincy Adams. And I was so excited you were on the train and you texted John Quincy Adams is extraordinary. And I felt the same thing as I was reading about him, that he distilled the virtuous life more inspiringly than any of the others. Spend some time on that because I, I, I know Jeff and I, I can, you know, he, he writes at a pretty 
high level of enthusiasm everything and everything that you do you do it at a, at a high level of enthusiasm which is a virtue i think um an earnest enthusiasm but i in your john quincy adams sections i was feeling your admiration for him and i'm wondering also you, you know how we always talk about even post hbo miniseries we talk about how john adams the father is is always thought of a little bit and lesser than Thomas Jefferson or George Washington. Uh, and Adams understood that in his life. I almost feel like John Quincy Adams is like a, yet another level that th there is a member of the, or a son of the founding generation uh, who's really an extraordinary person who we don't think about and talk about enough. But why don't you just give like a couple of minutes on, on how Qu John Quincy Adams for you personified um, you know, a person really devoted to trying to better himself and better, through bettering himself, um, finding the true meaning of happiness, but also bringing enlightenment to others. Absolutely. He summed up by this letter he wrote in his 20s, and he's just been appointed to and unanimously confirmed to the Supreme Court. He turns down the appointment because he wants to stay as minister to Russia and he's writing in his diary, which is one of the greatest diaries ever written by an American president. I'm 27 years old. My life has been dissipated in indolence, and I've accomplished nothing. <laughs> and he's just beating himself up for not having accomplished enough at, at this phase. And it, uh, it's because of his parents, the overwhelming pressure he got from John and Abigail to be perfect. And Abigail's always nagging him and haranguing him, not only uh, write more, you know, you never call or your handwriting should be better, but use your powers of reason to master your unreasonable passions. L there is avarice and ambition lurking everywhere. You've got to achieve self-perfection so you can serve others. And he internalizes that constantly, and he's always beating himself up for minor uh, failures of temper, I mean, I, he keeps these incredible diaries. You know, it's, I'm spending too much time at the theater. I'm growing corpulent. I'm, I'm getting stout. I'm uh, drinking too much. But right, he literally wrote, I'm becoming corpulent by going to the theater too much, <laughs> right, to himself. <laughs> to, to, like to he himself. could not even enjoy going to the theater without fearing corpulence. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, he, he thought he was drinking, uh, you know, too much, but, but, but always um, he never stops He's so self-aware, and he, in, the, in these very vivid, raw passages, is describing and recording his feelings. It's a spiritual diary. Um, he has a first phase where he's the Boylston professor of oratory at Harvard, reading Cicero and reading the literature and quoting from it and taking as his motto, Cicero's motto, from the Tusculan Disputations, the same book that inspired Jefferson and the same book that Locke and... Uh, Burlamaki quote as their inspiration, uh, actually his motto from Cicero is, I plant trees for another century. In other words, the fruits of my labors won't come to fruition now, it's for the future. It's always delayed gratification. And um, he becomes president, and of course his uh, term ends and uh, uh, begins with a defeat by Andrew Jackson and the popular vote, so he views Jackson as a demagogue, but he insists on this program of national Republican uh, internal improvements and envisions a national university and lighthouses in the sky that become the Smithsonian Institution, but he's repudiated by his party, and he's devastated and feels that the world has ended, and then he's been writing these letters to his son about how to be perfect, letters to a Christian constantly exhorting George Washington Adams to live up to their ideals, and the pressure's too much, and, and George Washington becomes an alcoholic and kills himself. And Adams is devastated. He's lost the presidency. He's lost his son. He prays for, for consolation from Cicero, and reading the Stoics allows him to determine to be more useful and serve his country in some ways, to make some use of the gifts he's been given. And then he becomes the greatest abolitionist of his time. And he denounces the gag rule in Congress, and he proposes an anti-slavery amendment to the Constitution. And this is before the Whig party is, is fully abolitionist, inspires Frederick Douglass to acclaim him as the greatest of the American presidents, and dies on the floor of Congress after denouncing the war with Mexico, and murmurs, I am composed 
which is a passage from Cicero, suggesting finally he's achieved not contentment. Some think he said, I am content, but it was almost certainly I am composed because it's the self-mastery and self-composure that defines the virtuous pursuit of happiness. Plus, I mean, there's so much more. I'll, yeah. I'll stop. But he argued, he argued the Amistad case for four days, uh, you know, uh, the tr triumph for the enslaved Africans. And, and, but it's so interesting. You know, a friend of mine just read the book and also resonated to John Quincy Adams and said, maybe I, you know, I'll beat up on myself a little bit less or my, my own efforts to try to make some use of my self. Uh, I'll, I'll be a little more forgiving on, but it's reassuring to see how hard he drove himself. Of course he went far too much, but it's so beautiful what he achieved. And the sonnets are really good too. And, and he wrote this anti-slavery sonnet and he didn't even transcribe it because he said it's in shorthand and if it were better, I would you know, maybe transcribe it. But it's, I, I, we too shall find how fierce is the prize. Roll on, roll, roll, fr fr freedom will remain. It's just gorgeous. So he's my favorite founder. One of the reasons he may be your favorite goes to contradiction or an essential weakness of the entire project of lifting up the founders. John Quincy Adams was, as you say, the great abolitionist of his time. Thomas Jefferson, among others, slaveholder, and many, many people uh, he enslaved. He knew what he was doing. He created a fantasy world in his mind that said that this was not as bad as it seemed, but nevertheless, you're holding up the founders and their virtues here, but you're also dealing with the fact that many of these men um, held slaves. How do you balance this out? How do, you, how, do you, how do you grade them on their adherence to these high values of character when they're doing what they were doing, especially the Virginians? Jefferson is even more of a shocking racist than I imagine. And the level of his hypocrisy um, is... Knowing hypocrisy. Knowing hypocrisy, because that's the most striking thing. As you said, they knew about their hypocrisy. And Jefferson listened in the Virginia legislature as Patrick Henry uh, delivered his give me liberty or give me death speech. And then wrote, Patrick Henry said, is it not amazing that I myself, who believe that slavery violates the natural rights of the Declaration, myself own slaves? I will not justify it. I will not attempt to. It's simple avarice or greed I won't do with the inconvenience of living without them. You, you bring up one of the most interesting aspects of Patrick Henry because the, the level of self-knowledge is complete, which means that he is actually living, he is actually undergoing the process of self-examination, which we don't ascribe to politicians very often, then or now. Um, and there's almost something admirable about his own recognition of his own terrible avarice in a kind of way. It, it absolutely is. And um, he was more self-aware than Jefferson, who accused others of avarice. He, Jefferson would always say, South Carolina and Georgia are refusing to let us end the international slave trade early because their avarice requires more imported enslaved people, whereas we in Virginia don't need that. J Jefferson just had remarkable capacity for self-rationalization uh, um, and was always insisting that slavery should end at some point in the distant future. And you asked, how do you grade them? The, the, the different grades. Jefferson was unusually hypocritical. Uh, George Washington did free his own enslaved population in his lifetime, unlike Jefferson, who only freed his own children by Sally Hammings, keeping his promise to her and had the rest of his population separated and sold. George With, Jefferson's law tutor, totally lived his um, ideals and freed all of his enslaved population and denounced slavery. Franklin changed. But what's so striking first is reading the moral philosophy helped me understand that they saw this conflict in moral terms. They directly viewed it as a battle between avarice and uh, virtue and some lived up to it and others didn't. Does it make you feel better about them that they at least knew they were doing a terrible thing? Or could you all almost say that if they had deluded themselves, maybe they would have eventually had some kind of breakthrough that would have allowed, I don't know. It's a, it's a very interesting question. I don't know the answer at all. It, it, um, 
I mean, it, it, it's, it's inspiring to, to see how some of them did live their ideals and striking how morally serious they were. They talked about their own efforts to be virtuous constantly, and they did recognize the hypocrisies when they existed. Others justified themselves and said, as James Wilson did, you know, I may have fallen short in any ways, but at least I was industrious. Um, but what really struck me is that... I mean, that could have been Mussolini's slogan, too. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the, the, the trains are, are absolutely running on time. The, um, uh, what, what's so striking, though, is that the same moral philosophy inspired Phyllis Wheatley and Frederick Douglass and David Walker to denounce the system of slavery and to insist that the founders be called up to their best ideals. The same moral philosophy inspired Mercy Otis Warren to demand the equal rights of women. So the philosophy itself is deeply inspiring and it is the inheritance of all Americans, black, uh, white women and men, we Jews and Christians, but we're human. Some people f uh, live up to it, others don't. It's also sobering. It's so easy to excuse ourselves for our own virtue today, not recognizing that we, uh, in similar situations, might have been just as f f fallen. Let's go all the way back to the beginning. The, 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 the question you are aiming to answer is where does this concept of pursuit of happiness come from? Obviously, in pre-Declaration of Independence documents, um, the Virginia, De Virginia Declaration of One, it was um, property instead of pursuit of, of happiness. Where did pursuit of happiness come into? I mean, obviously, the book does a very good job of tracing uh, the founders and their, their reading. And, and, but how does it politically move to the fore? And the second part of that question is, what did they mean? One of the most exciting things about this exciting project were electronic word searches. Everything is now online, and you just download the documents and search for the phrase pursuit of happiness or pursuing happiness. And I went through, started with Jefferson's reading list in his religion section, and nearly all those documents, both the ancient and the Enlightenment philosophy, contain the phrase, the pursuit of happiness. Now, these are from different sources. This is not all Stoic wisdom. Some is uh, either from, from Greece and Rome. Some of it is from the reasonable Christian theologians like Wollaston and Tolleston, who were the most popular preachers of their age and were trying to reconcile Christianity with reason. Others were from the Whig literature, like Cato's letters, where that's the source of the blessings of liberty phrase, as well as quoting Tacitus, we have to think as we will and speak as we think. And that contains the phrase, the pursuit of happiness. Blackstone's commentaries uh, contains it, the major law book of its time, defining it as the essence of reason and the purpose of law. And the civic republican sources um, uh, uh, like Locke um, on the liberal side and, and Machiavelli. So it's just hiding in plain sight. And th what is so striking to me is that People have focused in the past about how the pursuit of happiness is a substitute for property. It's not at all. Why did Jefferson leave it out? The phrase, all men are in, uh, endowed with natural rights to life, liberty, and property is in Locke's second treatise, which Jefferson had. But the phrase, the pursuit of happiness, is in the essay concerning human understanding, where it talks about the, how to be a good person. And Jefferson uses the pursuit of happiness and not property because property is an alienable natural right. It's a technical thing, but when you form a state of nature and move from the state of nature to civil society, you can alienate or surrender control over certain rights in order to secure the rights you've retained. And you have to alienate control over property because property itself is alienable. The right to pursue happiness can't be alienated because it's part of the rights of conscience. I can't surrender to you the power to tell me what to think because I can't command myself to think as you or I or anyone please. It's the product of my reason. So Jefferson was just being technically 
precise in leaving property off the list, but he wasn't being original in ad talking about life, liberty, and the pursuit of propertyness because all of the sources that I mentioned talk about the purposes of government being happiness. That's the first end of government, says Berlamaki, is the happiness of the people. John Adams puts that in his defenses on government. He gets it from Berlamaki. James Wilson writes it up in this piece called The Essay Concerning the Extent of Legislative Authority, which I saw at the Pennsylvania Historical Society right before COVID. It was so thrilling to see that first sentence. And then I thought, how am I going to get this transcribed? I looked, and gosh, the Quill Project put it online. It was just so cool. So I could go through and follow um, Wilson's footnotes and see that Jefferson had that document by his side. And of course, he had George Mason's Virginia Declaration of Rights, which, whose preamble sounds an awful lot like the Declaration and talks about the pursuit of happiness. So what's so important about all this is this is not some contested academic thesis I'm putting forward, this, it's, it's absolutely lousy with the idea. There, every single moral source on which the founders relied from all these different traditions all use the phrase, and they all have, you ask, what does it mean? They have a similar conception of it. There's a remarkable unanimity of, of what it doesn't mean, for one thing, uh, but what it means. And these are not men who necessarily all got along ideologically, They didn't get along at all ideologically. The division between Hamilton and Jefferson on national power versus states' rights and strict construction versus liberal construction defined American political and constitutional battles for the next 200 years. That's, this, that's my next book, which I'm really psyched about. But they all read the same books. Jefferson at uh, Williams, at, at the College of Williams and Mary, Hamilton at King's College, um, others through private tutors. It's what they were raised on. Their, their, their mothers told them to listen to this advice. And whether, you know, people dispute how Christian were the founders, they did not embrace the classical virtues of faith, hope, and charity. It was the classical vir virtues of temperance, prudence, courage, and justice, because that's what the, they got in the moral philosophy. And the Christian thinkers cited Cicero as well. So I was going to ask you that because to the extent that you've gotten any pushback at all, which I'm sure you deal with with equanimity and stoicism, um, you've, the, 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 the pushback you've gotten is that you are scanting the Christian uh, influence over their philosophy and the creation of the founding documents in favor of the Stoics and, and that, you know, the, the, uh, though they were some of the founders were theists, not traditional Christians. They were all more profoundly influenced by Christian thought than by stoical thought. Yes, that pushback is so interesting because it's a remarkable effort to exaggerate and misrepresent America as a Christian nation. And it's not supported by the sources because the point is that all of the sources, including the Christian ones, all cite Cicero. The point isn't that the founders were Stoics, it's that the reasonable Christians, and that's what they called themselves, who were rejecting dogma. Yeah, wait, could you just, just, just pause on that? Because I don't want people to think that you mean there's unreasonable, in, in, our, <laughs> in the current language no, no. of the day. The re reasonable Christianity is a term of art in the Enlightenment for people like uh, the, the liberal Christian uh, preachers who are the most popular preachers in America, like Woolitson and Tolitson, and Samuel John, for goodness sake, it's, such a, it's a really tendentious effort to misrepresent the core of America's founding as Christian because Samuel Johnson, who's the major textbook writer who Ben Franklin assigns at the University of Pennsylvania for their core curriculum, uses the phrase, the pursuit of happiness, many, many times. And he uh, gets it from Wollaston, who um, Franklin prints, and all of them think that Christianity is consistent with reason, that um, reason right. is virtue, which is living in accordance with um, our best interests. Reasonable Christianity then being the synthesis of enlightenment, Thinking. understanding of reason, yes. and Christian doctrine. Completely in no way denying um, uh, the Christian faith, arguing that it's completely consistent with right. it, but rejecting dogma and ritual and what Jefferson called monkish superstition. These people are very opposed to the authority of the established, uh, right. of established national church. But, and what's so striking is that the people today who are insisting that America was Christian at its founding cite 
an alien tradition that comes from Augustine. They're Neo-Augustinians, and they invoke a natural law tradition that remarkably doesn't appear in this book because the founders never cited it. They cited the liberal Christian thinkers, as well as all the others ones, the Stoics, the Civic Republicans, the uh, Blackstone legal theorists, and the Whigs. And again, all of these are citing, and it's not just Stoics, that's a kind of, Cicero is a synthesizer of Greek and Roman philosophy, so he's sometimes called a Stoic, some, sometimes a skeptic, more technically uh, precise. But he's getting it all from Pythagoras, who turns out to be the core in, uh, innovator of all Greek and Roman moral philosophy, instigates the reason-passion distinction that Plato then uh, epitomizes in the metaphor of the charioteer. And then they all, you know, like legal um, schools today of originalism versus textualism, the Stoics and the skeptics and, and so forth dispute on matters that are not ultimately uh, important to the consonants, the agreement, about the importance of using our reason to moderate and master our unreasonable emotions. Can I ask you a question about being an author who has a central thesis challenged? Do you find yourself in a better place? And this is a serious question. I know that it will cause some laughter, but do you find you're better able to control your emotions when you read a criticism of your own work about controlling your emotions? No, it's a crucial question because you know, it's a good test. Yes, there was a... There I mean, are you different after having absorbed the lessons that you're writing about? I, I, I really am. You're, there was a, a critical review in the Wall Street Journal um, over the weekend that said I wasn't Christian enough. And the old... <laughs> the old <laughs> it, well, there really is. It talked about the pagan influences of the, of, of the uh, Stoics and, and said that I should have... Uh, cared more about the Christian sources. It was, it was a review, it was very, it was very just can I yeah. try to contextualize it? Because it didn't actually have those words. Jeff Rosen isn't Christian enough. Um, I, that's although I, I, guess you, yeah. <laughs> I guess you were reading between the lines. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, it was a classic kind of review where the reviewer is not reviewing the book in question. The reviewer has a point that he wants to make a larger ideological point in the culture and is going to ride the book to in order to to get to that to get to that point. He actually was pretty respectful of the book overall, but just says that you um, misunderstand the crucial role of Christianity in the formation of American ideals and American documents. Uh, you know, the, the old Jeff would have gotten very huffy and outraged and what would the old Jeff like, have done? Uh, just like John Quincy Incredible Adams, Hulk like beating myself stuff. up and oh my God, and what's my mom going to think and, and that sort of thing. But no, the, the main thing that I w was struck by is the documents speak for themselves. This is, I'm just, his quarrel is not with me, it's with Thomas Jefferson's reading list. I just read the books on Jefferson's reading list and found that they all contained the phrase, the pursuit of happiness, and found that they all cited the same ancient sources. So I thought it was revelatory. I've also come to understand that there, I mean, I, I wouldn't have thought that a, uh, channeling the core moral philosophy of the founding would be controversial, but there is a division, uh, just as there is on the, between the left and the right, among conservatives, between uh, uh, common good and virtue-crat conservatives who th really take an Augustinian approach and think that there's a single revealed truth that people should embrace, and it's the revealed truth of the Christian church, and, and, those, and, and classical liberals, and I think I hit a nerve. I, I want to ask you this large question, shifting topics a, a, a little bit. As I'm reading this, as I'm listening to you, and we're in this place, we're looking at what we're looking at, we know that our, our politicians 250 years ago, uh, and it's almost 250 years ago, uh, actually, uh, were grappling with great weighty philosophical issues, and they were grappling even in public in a kind of way with their own frailties and trying to better themselves in public. There's a part of reading this, and I'm not trying to discourage anyone from reading it because it will make you a better person, but there's a part that, that you come to and you think, my God, what we've lost in our discourse in this country, where, where it's very, very hard, and I'm not talking about 
the most obvious character who doesn't seem particularly self-aware uh, on the national scene. Um, I'm not even talking about him. I just mean there's no room or space uh, or time for American leaders to sit and read and walk along the Potomac in the early hours of the morning and think about how they are going to be good in pursuit of their ultimate happiness, but be good, including good to others, during the day that is to come so that they can make the country a better place. I mean, it's, it, we're in a pretty debased place in our politics right now. I'm not saying it's necessarily the most debased it's ever been. 1859 was pretty lousy. Um, but did you have that feeling that I had that, boy, imagine if we had leaders who could read Cicero, understand Cicero, try to make themselves better by following Cicero's rules for happiness. Absolutely. The, the most inspiring uh, part of the Jefferson Adams story is their old age. And they've, they've fought, it was the bloodiest, most contested election in American history at that time. The first partisan election, really serious. Threats of violence, the, the whiskey, I mean, very, very serious times. They make up because of Abigail, who brings them back together. And what do they want to talk about? Um, Eastern philosophy. And Adams is so excited to learn that Pythagoras may have traveled and read the Hindu Vedas with the masters of the East. And he just, the thing he most wants to know is whether Joseph Priestley, the great uh, utilitarian, um, lived long enough to complete his translation of the Bhagavad Gita. And Jefferson says, good news, he lived, he finished it, I'll get you a copy from Paris. And Jefferson, and Adams is so thrilled that he's gonna get that book. And it's just so moving to think of how excited John Adams was to learn about that connection, and then how easy it is for me, and I can just sit on my couch and read the Bhagavad Gita and read those books. And in 1859, as we were just saying before the show started, terrible, the darkest moment for our country's history, and yet the debates between Webster and Haynes in 1830 uh, which are a prelude to secession and introduce the South Carolina doctrine of nullification, which they got from Jefferson. They're quoting Shakespeare and Banquo. Um, they are trading um, meaningful allusions and metaphors. The level is so high. They were so educated. And not all of them went to fancy schools. They read it in their homes. And Lincoln read it. He got the McGuffey Reader, which he would just read in his log cabin. And Frederick Douglass, my God, if you want any rebuke, every morning that I do the, I actually browse rather than read, think of Frederick Douglass. What was the point where he felt most crushed in his liberty? It was when his wicked master told his mistress not to teach him to read. And he felt the enslavement of my mind was even greater than the enslavement of my body. And he snuck out and pray and paid boys on the streets of Baltimore with bread to teach him to read. And then he got this book called The Columbian Orator, which is summed up the classical wisdom with little excerpts. And that inspired him to be the greatest abolitionist of, of all time. And, and books were so precious to them. And, and we can do it too. All we need is the discipline to read. It's absolutely extraordinary. We can do it too, except it seems impossible in this age to imagine our political leadership being contemplative. You know, because I'm, of the, and it's not just social media, and it's not just the coming of AI, but it's all it's those things and and many more things. I, the whole system seems to be built to work against your virtuous instincts as a politician, if you possess them. It, of course, it does, and it, and you know we've just been talking about personal uh, self discipline. Social media has obviously changed the whole media landscape of public discourse in a way that's the founder's nightmare. We've talked a lot about how Madison hoped that a class of journalists he called the literati would slowly diffuse reason across the land like a Atlantic uh, magazine for the 18th century. And people would read the Federalist Papers and discuss in, in coffee houses. And just social media, the speed of discourse and rage to engage, and the fact that you're rewarded for playing to your most inflamed and factious base rather than coolly deliberating and reading makes even readers in politics difficult to 
talk to the other side. So it's very hard. But on a personal level, look, I didn't, I've never read this deeply before. This is a very weird project that literally just kind of came to me in COVID. You need, it's a habit, I think, in what it is. And many of us read when we were kids in school, and then you get out of the habit. You're, I see some nods over there. And it's just making time, which requires rules, back to Franklin. So I think that, and I want to say it again, it is a radical act of self-assertion to read deeply. I'm saying that to the kids we talked to at the National Constitution Center and to all of you. It's so empowering. And it, it's not intuitive. You have to kind of set aside a pattern for it. But it, 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 maybe it can save um, our, it can save us as individuals. Whether it can save us as a society is a deep question. And, and you know, let's now talk about the fact that the founders weren't sure that the experiment could work. And when they when they said there wasn't enough virtue, they meant en masse are enough people right. going to be able to control themselves to make right. the thing work. Well, we we've talked in the past about Madison and his very skeptical nature about uh, a very skeptical view of human nature and whether. Uh, whether passion could ever be controlled long enough, or whether self-restraint could ever be exercised by large enough people, large enough group of people, to actually have a functioning democracy, and I think that is the acute challenge right now. I do want to I want to stay on this this question about the found because I don't want to get into a mode of over romanticizing the founders. I, I find it pretty romantic already, and so I have to check myself, right? Um, but the question is. It's an impossible question. If men and women of the founders' character, intelligence, curiosity, self-awareness, were in our politics today, in our current system, could they have survived and flourished? Or would what we have developed over time, the things that Madison was so worried about a couple of hundred years ago have come to pass, would anybody, would Ben Franklin be crushed? Would he be making TikTok videos attacking, <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know, whoever he'd be attacking? Uh, would, would, it, would they all, would, that, would that, that force be crushed out of them? Yes, they, they couldn't survive in a system where they're directly accountable and amenable to factions and where they had to talk fast. It was the structural incentives. That's the whole, if men were angels point, the system is devised not to imagine that people are perfect or not, but they'll respond to the incentives they have. And by checking and separating power and slowing down deliberation, and, and the Constitution itself is a document that fears direct democracy and wants to prevent our leaders didn't from being- Madison, Didn't Madison believe that no president should be in direct communication with the American people? That, that it should go through the Congress? Absolutely no tweeting presidents. Don't no tweeting. Don't address them directly. And um, so the idea of a State of the Union address, all the, the hoopla around that, that would have been anathema to him. Je Jefferson uh, reads it, uh, but it's it's anathema. And the rise of the demagogic president, which begins with Andrew Jackson, who was not a demagogue. It's important to get what's a definition of a demagogue. Let's say a uh, ambitious leader who flatters a portion of the people to install himself in permanent power and uses violence to break up the union or in, 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 incites insurrection. That was the definition that both Hamilton and Jefferson had. And I did find this amazing letter where Jefferson says, in the future, a president's going to lose an election by a few votes, cry foul, enlist the states who voted for him, and install himself for life. It's just predicting the future very strongly. If that's the definition, they're trying to avoid direct communication between candidates and the people. Jackson, who, when push comes to shove, rejects nullification and defends the union, liberty and union, but does insist on uh, direct communication and, and does listening tours of the people. And then uh, Woodrow Wilson and Theodore Roosevelt insist that the president's a steward of the people for the first time, rejecting the Madisonian model. But then comes radio and FDR, and mass communication makes possible a national demagogue in a way that it wasn't before radio, and now this. Social media and AI, talk about these phenomenon, phenomena in the, in the context of what we're 
ultimately talking about, which is finding leaders who can exercise self-restraint and self-knowledge. Talk about, talk about, I mean, because there's a, there's a very interesting discussion in the book about all, all of this in the context of the social media age. I think people want to hear that. Well, there's certainly, uh, social media is, is the antithesis of the Republic of Reason uh, to the degree that, um, remember the core definition of virtue is impulse control. It's the marshmallow test. It's waiting, if you take the marshmallow now, you get one. If you wait 15 minutes, you get two. The kids who waited, you know, had tremendous success. And it's to the degree that social media rewards likes, shares, immediate gratification rather than sober second thoughts, deliberation, and uh, reason. It's the antithesis of uh, our current age. Also, social media tends to depress and alienate and make kids feel alone. Deep reading and face-to-face interactions are the opposite. Um, AI poses a new, it's a whole new area, but it's a challenge to reason itself and to truth in a way that we're be- just beginning to understand. The inability to distinguish between truth and falsehood with AI is as radical a challenge to the enlightenment idea of reason as social media is itself. You, but there is a faith that with deep reading and deliberation, the truth will emerge. Because after all, the definition of virtue, the definition of divine, of divine harmony is living according to nature in order to pursue the truth. And there's some faith that given time enough for deliberation, the truth will emerge. And that's why the battle today for the liberal idea which is really the Enlightenment idea, is so serious. Uh, we're in the Constitution Center. I might as well ask you about the Constitution. Um, two cases in front of the Supreme Court right now. Can you give us your, your view of which way uh, the, well, the, 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 the first one is the Colorado case that I'm curious about. Uh, the idea that the 14th Amendment would allow for Donald Trump to be thrown off um, the ballot, and then, of course, the second one, if you want to address it. I just think people would be interested. I'd be interested to know what you think, where we're at. Well, um, the only interesting person in this room to talk about the case is Judge Ludic, who's here in the first uh, row and has written That's such. our second hour. We'll be... <laughs> He's, you, please check, uh, check out his, his extraordinarily illuminating briefs and commentary. And we did a great podcast on it, where we also presented the other side from Josh Blackman. And I mean, I, I can sum up the arguments, but this isn't the podcast, so I'm not going to do that. We all listened to the argument, and it looks like they're going to throw it out. So that's what we got. Right. The Constitution, we've talked about this before. The Constitution, if you had to describe its purpose in a sentence, it is, we don't want a king. Here's a system to prevent us having a king. Is that fair? I mean, is that, that's a crude version of what the founders were aiming for? That's a great version. I mean, the better version is right outside the building. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect I like my better. That was just, yeah. um, yours sums it up, which is that there can be no, uh, the, the power is the people. That's the thing. That was James Wilson's brilliant insight, and he's so underappreciated for having been the great apostle of popular sovereignty, greater than anyone else. The power is not in the king or in the president or Congress or in the states. The power belongs to we the people, and we parcel it out to different institutions of the federal government and among the federal governments and the states. Why? In order to secure the blessings of liberty, achieving the purposes of the declaration, which are to protect our equal liberty. We form government by consent. And that is why it's so important in America's 250 that we think what these basic ideas are so that we can learn them and understand them and see if we embrace them. The Declaration says we're created equal with natural rights of liberty, life, and the pursuit of happiness, and that to secure these rights, governments are instituted, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government, liberty, equality, natural rights, democracy. How do we do that through the Constitution? 
We ensure that that power is in the people. We separate it among the branches. We divide it between the federal government and the states. We have an independent judiciary and a rule of law. Federalism, separation of powers, the Bill of Rights and the rule of law. It's all there and that's why it's so good to think together and study and come together and be inspired by the fact that this is a battle for the American idea. It's an idea and it's an experiment and it won't work. And did you see that Emerson came up with the idea of the American idea? It was in the Atlantic um, in the 1850s and he defines One it. of our most prominent staff writers. <laughs> he, was a, he was a hit. There was a very... Hasn't done much lately, <laughs> I have to say. He, he defined it in the Atlantic as the American idea, emancipation. It was, it, was, it was liberty, it was freedom. What kind of freedom? Freedom of the mind. Where did Emerson get it? From the Stoics and the Bhagavad Gita. And he saw the connection between the Gita and the Stoics better than any American philosopher of the 19th century, although Adams had noted the same connection. And he, Jeff, that's what's so exciting. The American idea, is the pursuit of happiness, which is right. the pursuit of reason, but, but which I is have the pursuit to say, of freedom. Like, coming back to this, and, and, and I want to note this as we come to a close. I'm going to have you read your sonnet on the Bhagavad Gita, by the way, whether you want to or not. Um, but it's very interesting, and, and, and I'll have to do that in a minute. But I, I, I want to note this. It seems to be we're talking about really one thing, ultimately. When we were driving up from D.C. today, you, as you enter... The, as you're into Pennsylvania, there's a sign, Pennsylvania, pursue your happiness. Kind of made me a little bit, made my wife and I pretty depressed because it didn't seem like they were getting the point of what <laughs> the pursuit, you know, it sounds like, you know, follow your bliss or, you know, that song, if it makes you happy, it can't be that bad sort of thing. You know, yeah. you do you. It sounded more that than what you would want the state of Pennsylvania to stand for. Um, but we're, we're talking about, we're talking about the same thing here. We're talking about finding... A, a, a citizenry and a leadership that understands happiness as derived through the pursuit of virtue, through the pursuit of, 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 of self-restraint. And I think it comes down to what we were just talking about. Everything is built around the idea that we're all going to restrain our worst impulses, our dictatorial impulses. George Washington set the standard when he went back to the farm, Cincinnati. Um, we've come a long way from Cincinnati to, um, to having a, a, a presumptive candidate, Republican candidate, um, who doesn't want to go back to the farm at all and, 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 and wants to cheat his way back into power. That's very un-American, in my humble opinion. Um, and, and, and so, and so the, the question is, how do you, as an educator, you're the leader of this institution, how do you and others get this message out before it's too late? By having conversations like this, by convening all of our phenomenal teachers who are here tonight. And I'm so moved that the members of our teacher advisory council who are uh, teaching this wonderful Constitution 101 class are here. By you, incredible lifelong learners, do you know how moving it is to be a part of this amazing institution and have all of you come and listen to the podcasts and join and, and be lifelong learners. And what we're inspiring people to do is be like all of you who are just taking the time to educate yourself because you know that it is making the best use of your talents and it is the definition of the pursuit of happiness. We need to have a radical movement for learning and exciting curiosity about the American idea and the Constitution and the Declaration that will inspire people to want to learn more. And you have to be, look, we don't know what will happen with politics. Uh, history turns on small contingencies and wars begin and empires fall based on the smallest of happenstance or a few votes here or a choice there. So no individual can say what's going to happen with our democracy and these are very serious times. But we can empower ourselves and create this movement, this movement of curiosity and light and learning about the American idea, which will model exactly what the founders hoped for. And regardless of what happens with our democracy, will elevate and inspire ourselves. Um, 
This is called Notes on the Bhagavad Gita, Book Two, Self-Realization. Would you read that for everyone? I found the Gita, Neil Shah is here, and Neil is a friend and a member of our board. And a couple of years ago, Neil said to me, read the Bhagavad Gita. I read it as a kid and it's so meaningful. And it just summed up the core of the wisdom so beautifully for me. Self-realization. The wise see the eternal self in all. They have renounced every selfish desire. Not once disturbed by grief or pleasure's call, they live free from lust, fear, and anger. Always act without selfish attachment or desire for the fruits of your actions. Desire can burn to anger. Detachment allows an even mind's satisfactions. Reality lies in the eternal, not in the impermanent we're seeing. Train body, mind, senses, thoughts internal, and unite with the self in all being. Renounce selfish desire of I, mine, me. Enjoy freedom and immortality. Mm, it's so glorious. And Gandhi summed that up in the phrase, renounce and enjoy. And that's the core of the wisdom. And Adams tried to sum up the core of the wisdom too. And if you need any greater evidence that this is not a Christian or Buddhist or Jewish nation, but one founded on the deep connections among the great spiritual and wisdom traditions, you see Adams saying that it all can be expressed in the hymn of Cleonth. He said, my understanding, my faith at this point in my life is expressed in the myth of, hymn of Cleonth, love God and all his creatures, rejoice in all things. It's just beautiful and it's so true. It's the truth that different people find in different ways and different traditions, but it, it's summed up in that Gita poem so well. I, um, as we close, I, I would like to say in the most humble way uh, that I too work on sonnets in my spare time. But unlike you, um, I go to chat GPT to write my sonnets for me. <laughs> and I want to read you. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> My, my, my assignment to ChatGPT was, and by the way, I do recognize that ChatGPT could be the end of reality as we know, that, 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 that large learning models could be the end of reality as we, as we understand it, and it is yet another challenge to our democracy. I also have to say that, and this is the, the challenge of it, I can see good in it. And I certainly can see how mesmerizing it is. So my assignment to ChatGPT was, write a sonnet about Jeffrey Rosen's love of the US Constitution and also of sonnets. Oh, dear. And in approximately one second, <laughs> this is what it came up with. Okay. Are you ready? I don't, no, I'm not. No, you're not, are you? <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> in Rosen's heart, the Constitution reigns, a cherished love enduring and profound. It's words like poetry and flowing strains, with freedom's melody, its truths resound. Scary, right? I'm, I'm out of business. <laughs> out of business. <laughs> Within its verses, liberty is found, and every clause a promise to uphold, a beacon for the nation ever bound to justice rights and virtues manifold. This is where it gets really interesting. Yet in his soul, his soul, another love takes hold, the sonnet's form with <laughs> elegance and grace. In 14 lines, a story to unfold, a timeless art in its own sacred space. So let Jeffrey weave his passions hand in hand, the Constitution's love and sonnets grand. Wow. That's, <laughs> thank you, Chad it's, it's, it's miraculous and terrifying, and, and it's true. <laughs> you know what's so impressive about that? It incorporated the formal rule that I learned from Barry Edelstein, which I didn't. Then in the third verse, there's supposed to be a verso or switch where a you switch. start with one argument. and then, So it had the switch, and, the, and the, it scanned well, too. The meter was nice. Yeah. yeah. No. Wow. Uh, yeah. I, <laughs> We're in trouble. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but you can make yourself more human by reading this book. Um, you will learn so much. Um, it is an incredibly lively read. Um, it, it exposes you in, in the most uh, enthusiastic and erudite way possible to the, to the thinkers 
who influenced the thinkers who created our reality today. And uh, Jeff, it's great. It's a great accomplishment. And thank you very much for having me here and for doing this. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, thank you, thank you. For that. Today's episode was produced by Lana Ulrich, Tanea Tauber, and Bill Pollack. It was engineered by Advanced Staging Productions, David Stotts, and Bill Pollack. Research was provided by Samson Mastashare, Cooper Smith, Yara DeRese, and Lana Ulrich. As I mentioned, I'm so grateful to listeners who are reading The Pursuit of Happiness and letting me know what you think. If you'd like a signed book plate, email me at jrosen at constitutioncenter.org, and I would be honored to send one to you. Please recommend the show and the book to friends, colleagues, or anyone anywhere who's eager for a weekly dose of constitutional debate or a deep dive into the pursuit of happiness. You can sign up for the newsletter at constitutioncenter.org forward slash connect. And always remember that the National Constitution Center is a private nonprofit. Donations of any amount are much appreciated. You can support the mission by becoming a member at constitutioncenter.org forward slash membership or give a donation at constitutioncenter.org forward slash donate. On behalf of the National Constitution Center, I'm Jeffrey Rosen.